Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah Amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um, Before we start, I'd just like to introduce um, what FOSIS is So FOSIS is the Federation of Student Islamic Societies and um, I represent the uh, Services Committee in the North region which is the north of England including Manchester, Hull, York and uh, other major cities um, our main role is to buy socks, whether that need, whether that means helping them with their constitution or helping them uh, plan events or train the next committee. Um, we also try to campaign for people and be the Muslim voice nationally in the UK and Ireland, uh, whether that is uh, campaigning against prevent legislation or campaigning for Muslim halal loans. So I'll go through what the aims of today's webinar is. So commonly, mental health is discussed in the um, in talking about depression, anxiety, and so on. Um, but sometimes that are less uh, commonly discussed, or maybe a bit more controversial to discuss, are uh, put to the side. And I hope uh, through this webinar today that we'll be able to bring them to light. Um, so the aims today would be raising awareness of these lesser known yet surprisingly prevalent um, would be tackling the stigma attached um, to the survivors of, uh, of these issues and then signposting help to anyone who has suffered from these issues and also um, training or teaching people about how to offer help to someone who is close to them who has suffered from these issues. So. Um, I will introduce our speakers today. We have a prestigious panel. Um, first up, we have Sister Akila Ahmed. Um, she is the founder of She Speaks, We Hear. She's an equalities campaigner specializing in youth and gender issues. She has over 10 years of experience supporting vulnerable individuals with complex social and mental health difficulties, providing high-intensity support services to Young, uh, young people and homeless people from diverse backgrounds, including refugees, asylum seekers, ex-offenders, and BAME groups. Next up, we have uh, Sister Huda Ali. She is a driver of FGM, which is female genital mutilation. She is a nurse by trade. She is an activist in FGM. She works in a sexual health and HIV clinic. She has dedicated her professional life to raising awareness and campaigning for prevention of FGM, focused on ensuring girls are treated with dignity and compassion when they, are, when they encounter healthcare professionals in the NHS. And finally, we have Sister Leila Hussain. Um, Sister Leila Hussain is a trained psychotherapist and a multi-award winning campaigner on FGM. Amongst others, she is the recipient of the 2012 True Honor Award in recognition for her work on prevention of honor-based killing, uh, honor-based uh, violence, sorry, uh, protecting victims, survivors, and bringing perpetrators to justice. She received the World Peace and Prosperity Foundation Award in 2013. Um, she's also included in the BBC 100 Women list of 2013 and recently voted the sixth in Women's Hour 2014 uh, power list. Uh, she has co-founded the Daughters of Eve, um, who are working to protect girls and young women at risk of FGM. Um, there's much to say about all of these speakers, but um, I will start off this uh, conversation by directing a question to Sister Akila, who will give us an overview of mental health. Um, thank you so much uh, to Brother Khaled and uh, Fosis for giving me this opportunity to speak about mental health. Um, I'm going to give quite a broad overview of um, the types of mental health illness, what well, mental illnesses that uh, people can experience, um, and then I'll try and drill down a little bit into what that looks like for Muslim communities in the UK. Um, and then I know later on that we'll talk about more sort of specific sorts of issues and sort of, um, as, you, as Brother Khaled mentioned, uh, surprising issues that people have dealt with. Um, 
You've probably heard this statistic before. Um, it, it, it's sort of quoted a lot, but actually, um, it, it's when you think about it. So globally, one in four of us are likely to suffer with a diagnosable mental health problem during our lifetime. Now, this comes from the World Health Organization. Um, so what that means is that somebody that you know in your family or a friend has probably um, either dealt with a diagnosable mental health problem or they're going to deal with one at some point in their life. Now, a diagnosable mental health problem is a mental illness or problem that uh, you go to the doctor about and they diagnose you. It, it's not just you feeling a bit low or a bit anxious, which we all feel from time to time as you know we have different experiences in our life. Um, if you think about that statistic, um, actually it's not a surprise then that British Muslims also suffer with mental health issues. Um, how, what I've observed amongst the sort of communities um, since I've been working with them for the last 10 years or so is that um, there are trends where I see that people are becoming increasingly more ill uh, with poorer mental health outcomes um, however if this trend is left unchecked then we will see you know a disproportionate number of Muslim uh, British Muslims in sort of inpatient care dealing with mental health problems which can't be treated in the community but are treated in hospital um, and as we, as some of you may know, um, at the moment there are high numbers of Muslims in prisons. So there's a disproportionate number of Muslims in prisons. And I feel that if we don't deal with the problem of mental health issues in our communities, we will, in point in the future, be looking at high number of Muslims within the mental health system compared to the number of Muslims within the. Um, overall UK population. Um, so moving on to talking about mental health sort of generally, mental health problems are one of the main causes of the overall disease burden worldwide. So normally if you ask somebody, you know, what do you think is the main sort of illness that people face um, and that is, it has a huge burden, people talk about cancer or they will talk about heart disease. These are the sort of first things that come to your head, but actually mental health is one of the main causes of overall disease burden. I think it's something like the third or the fourth. Um, mental health and behavioral problems such as depression, anxiety, and drug, drug use are reported to be the primary drivers of disability worldwide, causing over 40 million years of disability in 20 to 29 year olds. Depression is thought to be the second leading cause of disability worldwide and a major contribution uh, a contributing factor to the burden of suicide and heart disease as well. So, you know, a mental health problem like depression not only will affect you mentally, but it can also affect you physically as well. Um, there's another sort of statistic that um, you will hear a lot sometimes, you know, charities will quote it a lot, and that is, is estimated that one in six people in the past week have experienced a common mental health problem. So, so Problem is something like anxiety, uh, something like depression, uh, um, maybe uh, self harm, and uh, other sort of common disorders. Um, so, what are the statistics for British Muslims? Well, actually, the data on mental health in British Muslims is inconsistent, and there are huge research gaps. Most of the data is derived from research conducted on BAME groups um, or looking at um, sort of patterns within Pakistan and Bangladeshi ethnic groups and obviously we know that doesn't cover you know Pakistanis and Bangladeshi people origin uh, only cover uh, about 50% of the Muslim community in, in the UK that leaves out so many other ethnic uh, minority groups uh, within the Muslim communities um, so there is huge gaps in the data but from having worked in this field my sense is that um, British Muslim communities it, 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 the sort of mirror the broader patterns that we see within the general population. So if we're saying that in the general population one in four people are likely to uh, deal with a diagnosable mental health disorder, then you know I think it's pretty much the same within the British Muslim communities as well. How, uh, there is one big difference, and I think that is that British Muslims dealing with mental health problems. Um, are not being uh, recognized, they're not being diagnosed, and therefore that means that they're not being treated 
by um, men, uh, mainstream services and organisations and they're not getting the adequate help and support that they need. Um, and we know from sort of statistics that comes out of this uh, census that Muslims, uh, certain groups within Muslim communities can be quite uh, marginalised and have poor educational and employment outcomes. Um, and therefore this means that there are certain Muslim communities which can be quite hard to reach. Um, and it's the same when you look at Muslim communities from a mental health perspective. Again, there are certain Muslim communities which are very hard to reach and, and um, are not getting the adequate help and support. I know, uh, you know, being a Muslim, that our lives are constantly scrutinised. So despite, you know, we're not sort of getting help and we're not in touch with services, we're also constantly scrutinised. You know, you just have to go online or pick up a newspaper and there's something, or you know, talking about, you know, a woman wearing niqab, you know, a, a, what is a Muslim uh, person eating, you know, where are they going to school, all of this kind of stuff. So there's this constant sort of lens on Muslims, yet we're finding that, you know, paradoxically, when Muslims, um, fortunately, they're not getting the help that they need. And there's lots of complex reasons behind this. It's not, we can't just attribute it to sort of a failure on part of mainstream services. Moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the gender disparities in mental health between men and women. Um, so gender differences occur particularly in the rates of common mental disorders, depression, anxiety and um, somatic complaints. So this is sort of complaints about aches and pains and things which have no sort of organic origin. Um, these disorders um, are most likely women will complain about these disorders and most likely they'll be the ones who will report it uh, to their GP. Um, and one in three people um, in the community and, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so basically, um, common mental disorders actually constitute quite a serious health problem and quite a, a big burden on so public services like the NHS. Um, I mentioned already that depression is sort of one of the leading causes of burden uh, globally and it's, it is predicted to be the second leading global disability by 2020, um, but it's also twice as common in women, um, so maybe more persistent in women. So women who experience depression is it, it, most likely to last longer than it is than men. Um, so um, alcohol or drug dependence which is also classed as a common common uh, mental health disorder um, men are twice more likely to suffer with uh, alcohol or drug dependence compared to women and this is especially in developed countries um, and it's thought that one in five men will develop um, a drug or alcohol dependence in their lives, whereas the statistic is 1 in 12 for women. So again, um, it tells us that somebody in our sphere, in our circle, or you know whether it's in our friend circle or family circle, could be dealing with an issue like alcohol or drug dependence. And now often as Muslims, you know, we kind of think, well, you know, we're Muslims, we're not supposed to drink, the Quran tells us not to drink or not to uh, take drugs, so why would we be facing these types of issues? And um, I myself, before I got into mental health, you know, I had this idea that there were certain issues that Muslims just never dealt with, and drug or alcohol dependency was one of those issues I thought Muslims don't deal with, but actually um, it, that is that Muslims are also affected by, and young Muslims are affected by it as well. And I think that, um, and we can talk about we'll probably talk about this a bit more later on, but actually um, I think our understanding about why somebody might develop alcohol dependency or drug dependency is sort of limited to thinking, limited to thinking about somebody engaging in something which is haram and making the wrong choices, but actually um, um, learn about mental health and you become more aware, you understand that there are much more complex reasons about why somebody will turn to alcohol or uh, drug use and um, 
one of the key things that data uh, that research tells us is that um, women are sort of dealing with difficult issues. They will um, uh, uh, they will suffer with depression, but men, rather than suffering uh, from depression, they will suffer with alcohol and or drug dependency. So the the two basically. Those, although they are expressed differently, are quite similar and come from the same sort of place. Especially, you know, and they're, and they're caused by social problems and challenges within somebody's life. Men are also more uh, likely uh, to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder than women, um, and you know, it comes from the way that uh, illnesses are experienced differently and, uh, and and how they manifest uh, differently between men and women. Um, to more sort of severe mental disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, which are um, psychotic illnesses, um, they affect less than probably about 2% of the population. So, you know, the, it's still, they, they are still illnesses which are a, a, which a minority of people are affected by, um, and there are no um, sort of gender differences um, in in the sort of prevalence. That um, what we do, what uh, if you look at the data, uh, what we find is that in the past, um, men were sort of were being disproportionately diagnosed with um, psychotic, uh, like schizophrenia, um, and other psychotic disorders. Um, and so there was this sort of um, puzzle about why as there high numbers of uh, black men dealing with these sorts of illnesses, and there was a lot of sort of debate and research being done and looking at, you know, is it because of is, is there some sort of physical cause or is there some sort of cultural cause or is there something which is particular to black men that is, means that they are suffering more from these illnesses? And actually there was nothing there um, to show that. But what the research did find was that when uh, black men were coming into contact with mental health services, they were doing it in a much more sort of... Um, um, coming into contact with mental health services either directly into the hospital or through when they would meet the criminal justice system. We showed that actually there was a failure on part of the mainstream services in not providing early intervention and, and help and, and not recognizing when you know young black men were dealing with, with mental health illnesses. And now um, we are finding the research tells us that actually uh, men of Pakistani and uh, Bangladeshi origin are now sort of showing similar patterns uh, when you look at them as a group as a whole. Um, you know, I think that probably within the Muslim communities there is uh, um, under underestimation of the amount of mental health problems that the that people in the communities are dealing with, and and also an underestimation of the range of illnesses that people are dealing with as well. Um, for example, having worked with in eating disorders, that again. The research, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago was that, you know, eating disorders like anorexia were only experienced by young white girls. Um, there was this idea that if you were Asian or black, you didn't uh, deal with an eating disorder, um, and especially you know, anorexia. Um, and now there's much more, well, it, there's still more work needs to be done, but now there is research coming out that actually you know, it's not about your ethnicity, you know, young Muslim girls, you know, young black girls, Asian girls, you know, girls from ethnic minorities are also dealing with eating disorders. Um, they're also dealing with anorexia. Anorexia, for example, is an illness which um, can kill you. You know, a third of people who suffer from anorexia, um, unfortunately, um, you know, from the illness um, and it can have devastating consequences um, and you know I think again there is this sort of idea that um, or stereotype that you know people from Muslim backgrounds don't deal with these illnesses I 
know of one case study where a um, parent took her her daughter, a Muslim parent took her daughter to the GP, um, and the daughter was experiencing uh, um, symptoms of anorexia, and the GP just sort of said, but um, but the exact words, but basically said, but you know, you can't be experiencing anorexia because you, in your culture, you eat a lot of fried samosas. That was quite a sort of startling thing for a GP to say. Um, but what this shows us was that there are stereotypes about Muslims that not only um, we hold about ourselves in terms of, you know, we come from traditional families and we have Islam, so therefore we shouldn't or, or wouldn't deal with these types of issues. But there are also, you know, these stereotypes that are held within your sort of average GP or whatever. Um, so now that, you know, there's been a lot of thinking and I think there is a realisation that actually, you know, you know we deal with all of these issues. It doesn't matter how taboo it is or how sensitive it is or how unlikely you think it is, Muslims will also be dealing with, you know, issues like anorexia, um, for example, or substance misuse. Okay, to move on. Um, Bit about the different types of disorders that men can deal with and women can deal with, but there are also um, sort of gender-specific risk factors. Anxiety, somatic symptoms, high rates of um, comorbid, and you have more than one mental uh, health problem at the same time. Are basically. Uh, um, on gender-based roles and the different stresses that men and women basically face in their life um, and the sort of different negative life experiences and events that men and women face. So um, more likely, for example, to be sexually harassed, women are more likely to face um, violence, they're more likely to face sexual violence and this often the not occurs in the home, you know, there are very, very high rates of domestic violence. We know that in the UK alone, uh, two, there is a statistic that people quote a lot that two women a week are killed by somebody that they know, by a man that they know. Um, and if you actually look at the um, these women, because there is an organisation that's been compiling the names of the women who have been sort of murdered, um, you will see quite a few Muslim names, you'll see quite a few BME names. And again, I think for some people this is quite shocking because you think, well, you know, we have our faith, so we shouldn't we shouldn't be dealing with these types of things. We shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be going on, domestic violence or whatever. But it, unfortunately, it does happen. And in certain, in certain areas, it happens more amongst the Muslim communities than it does, you know, compared to other communities. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know we have you know poorer outcomes in terms of health, and we have higher stresses in certain regards in terms of housing and poor education and poor employment, um, and then also you know increasing sort of Islamophobia and discrimination in the street. Um, so going back to sort of the gender specific risk factors, so we know that for a woman, because she's more likely to experience these types of uh, violence, then she is more likely to experience that. You know, that's going to have an impact on her mental health. So she's more likely to experience sort of common mental health disorders. Um, um, sexual violence to which women are exposed to um, also corresponds to a, a, a very high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so women who have experienced, you know, child abuse or have been raped or have experienced FGM, um, you know, they are going to be affected by it for the rest of their lives and they will deal with PTSD as a result uh, or face PTSD as a result. Um, you know, it's so disruptive to somebody's life if it's not dealt with, basically. So, so looking at the sort of um, the way sort of mental health seems to basically 
affect more um, than men. There is a question about if there is gender bias within the sort of uh, diagnosis and treatment of psychological disorders. Well, um, it is a fact that doctors are most likely to diagnose depression in women compared to men. Um, again, some of this is around the lack of understanding about how depression is expressed in men. Uh, we now know it's, just, it's expressed through sort of drug and alcohol dependency. Um, also, women are more likely to be offered medication uh, rather than sort of offered uh, talking therapies and treatments. Um, and that indicates, again, a bias. Um, this is about, you know, attitudes towards women and, and having worked with Muslim women, you know, uh, know that there are sort of, they face a lot of um, sort of stereotypes when they do go to the doctor or go and try and get help for mental health issues. They will often um, hold that actually, you know, the cause of their issues comes from their culture, it comes from their faith. Um, or it, or stereotypically, you know, it's it is caused by the men in their family, which, you know, happens a lot for a lot of women. But, you know, if a woman's going to go and get help for a problem, then, you know, she shouldn't be told that your problem is because of, you know, the men in your family. That, that shouldn't be an assumption that's made. Unfortunately, that happens. Um, This, this sort of these sort of stereotypes about women and about um, Muslim women in particular, they cough from getting help, stigmatized basically. Um, uh, you know, and they stigmatize uh, Muslims as well because because these stereotypes are not just against Muslim women; they're also against Muslim men as well. Um, and it means then that they are not you know, people are not getting the help that they need. Um, and the issue is that when, um, um, even men, when they are experiencing mental health problems related to domestic violence that they've experienced, um, these, these symptoms are not being picked up on. Um, and again, that means that people are reluctant to go and get help because they uh, feel like they will be stigmatized because they're experiencing um, domestic violence, so these these issues are quite sort of complex. Um, lots of different reasons why you know uh, mainstream services would hold these sorts of um, stereotypes, um, and that's why it's important to it's important for people who do work in mental health to work with mainstream services to educate them about sort of the range of issues that uh, Muslims face, and that's why. Also, within our own communities, it's important that we are aware of the different types of mental health issues that are going on and how we can help people um, and raise awareness about them. Um, the specific issues that um, women can face, and indeed Muslim men as well, are eating disorders, body image related disorders, um, depression, anxiety, self harm, and psychosis, which pretty much covers. You know, all uh, sort of a broad spectrum of mental health um, issues within the within the um, sort of communities through a case study because I think this kind of highlights some of the kind of issues um, that people might face when they're dealing with uh, a mental health problem. So um, this case study is based on somebody. Uh, that I've worked with in the past, um, and I've anonymized the details. Um, so Sophie was a 22-year-old, um, and she was suffering with bipolar disorder. Um, she'd been diagnosed by her doctor. She had a very difficult relationship with her father, um, and her family did not accept her condition as a mental illness. Um, she was receiving help from a psychiatrist who recommended that she takes a therapy known as DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy, which is quite a specialized intensive therapy which spans um, a few months, uh, which treatment spans a few months. However, her parents did not want her to attend this um, therapy. They felt that if she 
basically therapy then she would be diagnosed and labeled well she was already diagnosed but she would be labeled as somebody who's got a mental health problem and then this would um, give the family a bad name um, it would also mean that nobody would want to marry her um, he was a child um, she had been raped by a close relative uh, however her family were not aware they did not know that this happened until Sophie reached her teen years and um, Year, she started to get depressed, um, which affected her life at school. She started to uh, play truant. She started to smoke cannabis. Um, and she tried to talk to her family about what she had experienced, the child abuse she had experienced, but they didn't want to know. They sort of swept it under the carpet. It was very much, um, you know, this, this does not happen to us and to our type of people and they just thought by sweeping under the carpet you know they wouldn't have to deal with it so since her late teens Sophie um, you know her school basically intervened and she uh, started to get help from her doctor and she was basically given medication but her condition worsened and um, she started to become violently abusive towards her younger brother and even other people on the street um, started to display quite destructive sort of behaviours um, and she basically was at the point where her psychiatrist said to her that you know, would you like to you know would you voluntarily come into hospital and have you know, stay in inpatient care and receive this therapy. Um, um, her parents had refused and they said they did not want that to happen. And um, they told her that basically, you know, if she did not go into inpatient care for her problems, then she would be sectioned. And section is, uh, for people who don't know, is basically when um, a mental health team works with the police to force somebody to go into into the hospital and get treatment for their mental health issues. So from this case study that Sophie, she had dealt with child abuse, which is something that we do not speak about in our community, able to get help for it. That when she did get help for it, she basically was um, rejected by her family and uh, um, people suffered abuse in their childhood if they're rejected by their family it's almost like they're going through the abuse again. Sometimes it's even worse, you know, than going through the abuse. To be rejected by your family, to not be believed, to be con to, to somehow to be made to feel less, uh, you know, to feel shame. Uh, and it was very difficult for her. And because she had these issues that were not being dealt with, and as a teenager, you know, it, it comes out one way or the other, and it came out through these um, sort of destructive behaviours. But again, she still wasn't getting the help. She wasn't getting therapy. She was only receiving medication, and medication is only one part of treating somebody. Um, and so she was then, you know, it got to the point where then she was becoming violent towards other people. Now, obviously, this is unusual for somebody to become violent towards other people. Um, but she had just, you know, she had started to smoke cannabis, so she had been on this sort of downward spiral of not getting help. Um, you know, her, her her psychiatrist, her doctor, you know, they tried to help her, but they could only do so much. You know, the family and um, and the role that people around you can play is important, and actually more important probably than mainstream services. And in this case for Sophie, she was let down by her family. Um, and this is not to blame her family, but it's it's something that is quite common in that in our communities we don't talk about these issues and we are sort of not aware about them and we're not we we're not sort of um equipped to deal with them talk through another case study before I sort of finish um so um there was a young girl uh, that was at university and uh, she had a um, 
relationship with her um her father her mother um wasn't wasn't around um so she mostly uh was careful by her father and her aunt but she had a strained relationship with her father one day she'd happened to argue with her father so she left the house um at 2 a.m. and um and then she basically was was raped um, rape she didn't tell anybody um and she just sort of um goes um, anybody she just sort of sat on the fact that she had experienced this and then a few months down the line something happened in her life um which uh basically she was experiencing PTSD um and she wasn't able to sleep at night she was having nightmares she couldn't concentrate in her studies and so then she felt that she needed to try and get help um but before that um she had basically been in another argument with i think this time with her aunt and in that argument she had ended up telling her that she'd been raped and her aunt said to her well you know it's your fault you went out late at night you go out um you shouldn't have and that's why you were raped um and <clears throat> Hannah she uh, she wore the hijab um but she you know felt completely destroyed by what her aunt had told her and this is when her sort of uh PTSD symptoms came out uh really badly um and that's when she decided to go and get help because uh, um what she had said right and that was very very traumatic it was very bad but when her aunt had blamed her then that was really like the the, the straw that broke the camel's back um and to highlight this because again you know I think that goes on within you know it goes on with within society there are very high rates of you know of sexual violence and i think you know we have this idea being muslims that you know if you wear hijab or because you know if you're modest or something you're somehow protected and uh, actually if somebody is going to you know commit something like you know sexual violence against a woman or whoever then they're going to do that there's nothing you know and and they would do that against anybody you know wearing hijab or being modest is not going from that um and so ne- there shouldn't be any circumstances in which a victim is blamed um that understanding it has a huge impact on on people who are dealing with these sorts of issues of experience issues like child abuse or rape and that's why it's so important again I, I keep saying this and I keep repeating it again and again but that's why it's so important that we are aware of these issues and we are aware of uh how how to help people um this a bit about the social causes of mental health problems and especially common mental health problems um and I'll just sort of summarize them um social exclusion social deprivation isolation lack of support and help fear of being misunderstood by mainstream services or being stereotyped um, which stops people from getting help um feelings of shame and denial which stop people from getting help these all contribute to um recent statistics we know that islamophobia and uh, um actually that's also having a big effect on the mental health of people especially women um so just sort of quickly what can we do to address uh, mental health issues so we can you know have um where we basically um you know we raise awareness about different mental health problems uh we tackle stigma and taboo around mental health problems which actually you know it can be deadly you know taboo and stigma and you know worry that you're going to be labeled or that it's going to you know your family is going to be spoken about in the community or whatever it stops people from getting help and that can lead to people being isolated and um lead to people then self-harming or worse um it's really important when you think that somebody might be dealing with an issue like this that uh, you know we talk about it openly and honestly 
amongst our friends and family and our communities. We talk about these issues in the mosques as well. Um, and we try and create safe spaces in mosques or community centers. People can get help from, mental health, from qualified mental health professionals. Um, and culturally sensitive help and support is also really important. And now there is um, more work being done in this area. We know that there are, you know, Isla there's Islamic counseling that's available. And also actually now some mainstream services are providing this type of support. In Leicester, for example, they're doing research around this and they are, they've produced a booklet on how you can, as an individual, you know, you can incorporate Islam into any sort of therapeutic um, treatment plan for depression, for example. Um, and then, you know, prevention is always better than cure and, you know, um, having better social support networks and, again, just talking about, you know, awareness and, and talking about issues are all going to help um, basically uh, prevent mental health problems and, 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 and hopefully we won't be looking at this sort of stark reality where Muslims are sort of disproportionately dealing with mental health issues compared to the rest of the population. Uh, and there's also, you know, there's charities as well where you can get help. Um, and there's a youth charity called The Mix. Um, there's The Samaritans. There's Sane Line. There's Mind. There's different charities that you can also get help as well. And they have lots of information about mental health. So it's well worth doing, you know, doing a bit of research, going online, and just having a look at these charities and looking at the information that they have there about mental health. Okay, here, thank you. That's just uh, Akila. Uh, that was definitely uh, um, very beneficial. Alhamdulillah. Um, I will first. Pa I will pass it on now to Sister Leila. Um, since you have experience, obviously uh, as a psychotherapist, um, how would you say someone who is a student, whether they are male or female, um, at university or at college? How can they either reach out to their friends, um, or if uh, how can they provide help, provide support? What do you think are effective ways to do that? Uh, thanks, Sister Akila, for giving us um, an outline of mental health. Um, before I answer that question, actually, I would like to kind of add a couple of points to. to when we are talking about mental health, especially around Black and Asian communities, key areas that we don't ever look at is creating safe spaces. And when I say safe space, I don't mean uh, an empty room, um, you know, with nice decoration. I mean a place where you don't feel judged. I, I mean, we need to remember the context within the UK. Uh, mental health is already a taboo within the UK society itself. So with patriarchal communities, and now we're talking about Muslim communities, it's, it's even in a worse situation. And so creating safe spaces are absolutely key to this work. And um, the work that I've done, so I, I, I found the Dahlia Project, which is the first ever counseling service for FGM survivors. Early on, we already understood in order to tackle these issues, especially mental health issues, we actually needed to go into the communities themselves and actually start creating a dialogue, safe space where the women can, men and women can have a dialogue about mental health. Because if you actually go into the community and speak to them, they have an assumption of what mental health actually is. And I think that's really important. So with the, the, the framework of our work at the Dahlia Project, actually, before we do any counseling for anybody, we actually go and work with the community for a couple of weeks. So we gain their trust, we create that safe space, we create that dialogue. And by the time they come and actually come for a counseling session, they're in a place where the invite level is not actually that high. And also we talked about certain addictions earlier. We talked about alcohol and drug addiction, but what we've forgotten to mention that it's very common, um, it's sex addiction. Sex addiction is extremely common. Uh, when it comes to mental health, especially amongst men and women, you know, girls, if you go to our secondary schools, high schools now, 
you'll find a lot of girls are using sex as a form of dealing with mental health issues. And I think in order for us to deal, like Sister Akila said, in order for us to deal with this, we really need to be honest about what's really going on and what that picture actually looks like. And the current theme that constantly comes up, you know, when we're talking about mental health, it's guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. And if, as Muslims, when we talk about shame, the last thing we want to do to our families is to bring shame. And when we're talking about mental health, the current theme we constantly, that constantly comes up is shame. And I really wanted to kind of uh, uh, make that point. And in terms of women who have undergone FGM, it's not just post-traumatic stress they deal with. You know, a lot of them uh, present with personality depression at some point. Sexual dysfunction is another one because the whole idea of FGM is to control their sex and sexuality. So really it's important when we are talking about mental health, we look at it, the, the conversation, it, it has to be wider and it has to be much more open. But in order to do that, we need safe spaces. For example, this webinar seems to be a safe space to have that conversation. Going back to your question, how would a student reach out uh, for mental health service? Um, I would suggest the the faculties that they go to number one has counseling services they should have counseling services i would suggest you reach out to them if not reach out to maybe somebody within the university colleagues so if it's your professor or a lecturer that you trust reach out to that person but most importantly if you belong to a particular society i would suggest to every single university society that's out there to have something around mental health and supporting um, the students and you don't really have to do much all you need to do is actually start the conversation about mental health and have small sessions around mental health and what I found like I said you know when I go into communities the moment we start the conversation you will find a lot of people will actually openly come out and say I'm actually suffering with this I can openly say this now on camera and I've openly talked about my um, history of depression you know it's something that I've suffered with uh, since I was a teenager but when, when someone actually hears you that, it makes a big difference because what they'll do, what they'll realize, actually, it's not such a taboo issue. It is quite open. If Leila can talk about it, if Akila can talk about it, if Hala can talk about it, it's okay. So that's what I would say to any student out there and those who run specific university society, um, society groups to actually put some sort of mandate or policy around mental health for the young people that you are associated with. But every single university should have um, a counseling service. If not, you can always go to your GP. Sorry, you can always go to your GP. There are free counseling services out there. A couple of the names, uh, Sister Kelly mentioned mine is one of them. Um, I always say to any young person reach out to them, I'm like, you know what, just Google. Google is a very useful tool. I know we laugh about it sometimes, but actually, Googling my local counselling service and type the name where you're at, you, you'll be amazed to find how many free services you might find in those areas. And these days you can actually get support online as well. So there are online counselling services you can reach out to. Some are free, some you have to pay for, but you can always find a free one. So that's really what I would say to um, any student who might seek some mental health services. But also we need to also recognise Earlier on, I think Sister Kili mentioned men were, di men, were men were the ones who were mainly diagnosed with certain mental health issues. There's a reason for that, why women have been diagnosed, because women are not even allowed to mention mental health or even express the idea of having mental health. If a woman, especially within the Muslim community, I, was, I wouldn't say Islam, because Islam and the community of practice are two different people, two different things. In Islam, for example, from some of the con some of the texts that I read, actually the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, talks about in many of his con you know talks about mental health quite openly and how we should be supporting those who suffer from mental health. But what the community has done interpreted this into some this idea of the word jinn, for example. You will find people say you are possessed by the devil. You know, so it's important. I know by uh, what young people in the past, a lot of young people didn't, they, they couldn't even go to university, they couldn't even study anymore because they were, especially with young women who were diagnosed with bipolar and, and psychosis. Instead of families taking them to the doctors, they took them to these 
um, houses where they will read the Quran on them. And actually, in, in okay, sorry, someone just came in. <laughs> in the world of mental health, in the world of mental health, faith is absolutely recognized. They actually, you will find a lot of world world recognized psychologists, psychotherapists, will say faith is a really big part of your healing. However, have, but there is a reason why when you diagnose with certain conditions that you do need to seek medical help. You do need to go seek. Uh, the, the help of a hospital. And my fear is a lot of girls are actually not diagnosed. It's because girls are not even coming forward or families are not even putting them forward if they see signs of these uh, uh, mental health issues out there. Um, just to, to need to step out at 8.30. Another Skype call I need to make. Problem. Jazakallah. Thank you for that so much. And I would actually... Um, just before you had to leave, I'd ask um, if someone, like in some of the um, case studies that Sister Akila mentioned, where they've been rejected from the, by their families or they feel in a right, in just perhaps you don't want to find help sometimes. And um, how would someone, friend of, of, of someone who suffers from these issues, how would they approach the situation? Because sometimes you can make the situation worse, or maybe people think, I don't know, approach this person because I feel I'm going to make it worse, and so I'm just going to leave it. So how how do you go about doing that for men and women in this in this circumstance? I mean, how would you approach, for example, if a friend had addiction issues or mental health issues? Unfortunately, as a friend, all you can do is actually open a question. So, for example, if a friend, you notice a friend um, isn't functioning. When I say not functioning, I mean not getting out of bed, they're not coming to classes, they're feeling depressed, they're feeling sad at all times. What you could do is encourage them maybe to come out for a coffee if they want to come out for a coffee or go and see them with some food. Go in there really with a non-judgment um, approach. And just say, listen, you know, I can see you're not yourself. Something's happening. Um, from what I understand, when somebody shows these kind of symptoms, it might be some sort of uh, depression. There might be a little bit of a mental health issue. But you know you can get help for this. You know, you're not alone. I'm your friend. I'm here to support you. So really, it's the tone of voice and your facial expression is really important. And you'll find when you say that to someone, even if they reject you at that point, they actually will listen to that advice and you'll find somewhere along the line they will thank you for that advice because they just needed some. Sometimes they just need someone to say it to them because they might be feeling, I might be always feeling like this, but if somebody came to them and said, actually, I understand, I can see so it's acknowledging something's actually going on because usually what we do, we ignore what's going on. So it's for someone to acknowledge what's going on is actually a first step to start that healing process. And I think it's just reassuring us that you're going to be there regardless. I think that's all somebody who's very depressed needs. And to say, listen, you know, on your day, when you're in bed, let me know. I'll bring you some food. You can stay in bed. I'll bring you some food. You'll find that person's more likely to get out of bed when you turn up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very practical and uh, realistic advice. And I think it's great what you said at the end, not having to jolly along someone and just accept that they're upset, but then just be there for them. Um, I'll move on to um, Sister Huda now. Um, now, as you all uh, are next with uh, um, this diseases, so you see one other aspect of this as a either um, a repercussion of consensual or non-consensual sex rape. Um, so could you speak from your... Um, from the angle of your profession about uh, sexual abuse, either in young adulthood or in childhood for people who are now students at university, um, and also how you think um, this issue could be resolved but from what hasn't been mentioned already. I'm listening to you all. Um, I'm so emotional right now. Like. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but there is so much happening in our community, and we need to open our eyes. That is to start with. Um, 
for what I see in my professional life is that um, good our children are our loved ones, are the people that have to equip themselves, i.e. tell them what life is about. And for me, is that what I'm seeing right now? For what I'm seeing, can everybody hear me, please? Because I feel like I can just hear myself. Um, a lot of things happening in our community, and I'm talking to the Muslim community right now. I want you to all open your eyes and open your ears and listen to this, because we are discriminating young people i.e. not to come out and speak to us. So if they're having an, a really hard time in life, a chance to come and talk. Because of that, our young people chose not to come and talk to us, and even as an adult. So right now as a health professional, the things that I see and the things that I... <laughs> I find it really hard to breathe now after listening to all of you talking and it seems like I kind of lost my voice to what I wanted to talk about was listen and this is man and woman and, and, and you know old and young we don't listen to them, to them in our community so right now we are Kids that I see who are Muslim raped by their husbands. The fact because is I am your husband and I have the right to do that. When that happens, they cannot go out and complain. They cannot go to the community and say, oh, my husband raped me, raped me. Um, because there's no such a thing in the community or where we grow up because nobody told us about that. Nobody said anything about it. And right now we have Sister Akela who talked about what mental health is. We have uh, Sister Leila who talked about the psychological effects of that. But nobody speaks for the community. Nobody speaks for the, for the man and the woman of how they feel. So right now I'm going to take myself out of the professional side of it and talk for them and what I actually see. See. And what I see and what I want people when they are looking at this interview today or, or of looking what we are doing, they need to listen to what is actually happening. And what is happening in our community is that we are told not to talk about things. We are told that what happen, uh, whatever happens in the house, it stays in the house. And because of that, we have uncles that was invited to the house. We don't know anything about them. We have friends who are invited to the house. We have not. We don't know nothing about them, but we were told to obey of them. We were told to respect them and take care of them. But guess what? They are traitors. The ones who come in and abusing these young kids and these young boys talk about at all of what they feel like because. It just doesn't exist in our community. So the first of all, what we need to talk about is listen to the people, listen to me, listen to the young people that were talking about what they need to talk about. But let me go back to my professional life because I'm just being emotional. <laughs> listen to everybody. Um, young people who are being raped at home. We have young people that were sent home because of a civil war or whatever the reason is. It was like, I can't come to Europe. I want uncles and aunties to take care of these children. These children came to Europe and these children have been mistreated. I'm mistreated. They, don't, they have no choice to talk about that because nobody gives them the platform to talk about what is happening to them. They go through depression. And after gym, they go through the psychotic episode that that is happening. 
I feel like I'm not making sense because I'm so mad right now. Um, but I want to talk about case studies and I want to talk about what I just saw today in the last three hours of my work. And maybe that's why I'm shutting down because right now I just don't want to tell you, you guys, I can't hear back at you, but I really feel emotional about this and I can't keep it professional. I really can't keep it professional because it's so sad as a human being for these people to go through what they go through. For what? Why do they have to go through that? Why is it that if I be raped, that I cannot come to you, Leila? I cannot come to you, Akila. I cannot come to you, sister, brother Khalid, to talk about me, to talk about what happened to me. Stigma. Because of, oh, you did something wrong. And because of that, our people are not coming forward. Our people are not talking about what is affecting them. They'd rather go and kill themselves than to talk to us because we are not giving them the platform to give them the chance. And, the, and, and what is the English word? Um, somebody like the chance to talk to be empowered with themselves. We are not doing that. I was Somalia. I grew up in Somalia. I left in Somalia when I was 17 years old. Born in Muslim. It's wrong and right. I know what I'm supposed to do and, and not do. But guess what? Things go wrong. What's happening to our people is that we are not given a chance to talk. So Sister Layla talked about safe space. How do we talk about safe space when a sister or a brother has gone through rape or an abuse? But we are not good enough. We are not good enough because what you are saying is just not right. And what you are saying is, sh is bringing shame to the family. That is another thing about bringing shame to the family. A lot of us, are, a lot of these people who are going through mental health are not coming through because if they speak about it, they bring the shame to the family. I'll give you an example. I have 30-year-old patient who was born in Somalia. And at the age of five, she came to the UK. And at the age of 12, she was married off at the arranged marriage. And that first marriage, she was abused and failed. Get out of that relationship. And she was told, because you know what? You are married now. You are a married woman now. You can't do that and you can't get her come out. She ran away. Her partner, who are the Muslim country, Somali community, that she understand, and she went through it. And she thought, you know what, this is my savior. She married him. She had another child. He did the same as her first marriage at the age of 12. I want you guys to think about the age here. Yeah. 12 years old when she was married. By the age she was about 17, she divorced and she was going to get married again. That did not end up being an abusive relationship. And she had a child, but she still couldn't go. Because when she went to her family... They told her, like, mm, that's your husband. You need to obey him and you need to listen to him. She found a way to get out of that relationship and she got on to the next, the third relationship, another Muslim brother who give her the, who, who make her feel like he was going to give her the world. And that ended up in um, a big well. This sister ended up having seven children for three different men. And all of her kids are in care. 
all of our children were taken away from her and they went into the social service, they went into the care. Her children are being fostered or adopted by another family she do know nothing about. She carried those kids. She gave birth to all of them. But she never gave, she never gave them the I'm not a mother, but Sister Akela, I think you're a mother. Sister Leila, I know you're a mother. I don't know what it feels like when you're a mother and your children are taken away. But this woman to have seven children and they were taken away. Children. That she had taken away. But no one has sat down and asked her what was wrong with this. What was wrong with Sister A? Why did she give birth to seven children and all of them was taken away? No one asked her that. No one asked her the platform to talk about herself and how she felt. What did they say? To be a mother. You know what happened in her relationship? She was told she was fat. She was told she was ugly. She was told she was never fit for anything that she did in her life. She was not good enough. And guess what? As I speak to her today, she became anorexic. So, her seven children were taken away. She had nobody to look after her. No one to say to her, sit down. Can I talk to you? What is wrong with you? What is happening in your life? Not that. And the third was your children are taken away. You can have them back. You need to find out and figure out what's wrong with you. Now, no one gives a chance to that sister or those brothers out there that none of us know about. So for me, I'm going to be the devil advocate for our community. I'm going to be the devil advocate now talking to you all. I want to know why is it that we are discriminating our own people? Why is it as a Muslim people that Allah has said, be kind? Because Islam is all about being kind and helping each other. But we're not doing that. We are not doing that. We are inviting uncle and the aunties and the cousins we know nothing about to abuse our children. And then we don't give our children a voice to talk about their feelings. And we don't give our children a choice to talk about what is it that is bothering them. Oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe I'm not keeping it professional this, but I am speaking for the patients. I'm speaking for the people that I see. I have a case study that it's a sister who converted to Islam by her husband. A test on her oh I need to do a semi test. I cannot do semi test because her feces is coming through her vagina. Talk about these things. I have to talk about these things. I have to talk about the things we closed out. It's like a curtain. It's like you open the window and you see the sunshine. And if you don't like, feel like sunshine, we close it. This is how we become as the Muslim community that we're supposed to take care of one another. We fast. We pray. People. Guess what? They're vulnerable and we need help. Oh, the shaitan. You are adopted by the shaitan, and we need to read the Quran on you. Quran on you, because we need to get the shaitan out of you. 
Yes. The things happening in our community, the things that is affecting us, these, these are the things affecting our sisters and our brothers and our nieces and our nephews. And nobody wanted to open their eyes to listen or to understand. All I need is for you to listen to me. So what I want to say to the Muslim community, what I want to say to my community is that when you're inviting these uncles and cousins that we don't know, listen to me. So uncomfortable. And I tell you, I, I expect you to react. I expect you as my parents or my sisters or the family person in my community who's looking after me, I want you to listen to me. And this is not what's happening right now in our community. We have a woman who is compared to Islam, or we have a sister who was born to Islam like me. Realize that what we are doing to our people. In India, I grow up. We don't have a word for mental health. That if I wanted to talk about some a patient in a medical setting, why do I have to explain or, 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 or write in my medical notes as they are crazy? Because that's not in my language. In Somali language, I don't have a, a mental health language. If I'm going to have to talk about somebody, is that they are mad or oh, the crazy person. So I'm in Somalia in Hargeisa, and I remember as a young child, I remember from the age of five until I, I was eight, year, eight years old, I used to go to the, the family that was lived in front of us. And I remember this auntie was chained in an empty room. There was nothing in that room, nothing at all, except a, a, a pole in the middle of the room. And she was chained to that. And that was to give her this sister and it's in order to help her because what would happen if she didn't do that she would be running around the street there was no medical help there was no hospital there was no hostel there was no safe space to take this woman and man so if they were crazy as my language says there was no help so they would run around and I remember as a young girl growing up it was like Oh my God, come in, come in. I was like, why am I coming in for? And it was like, oh, so-and-so crazy person is outside. And guess what the person was doing? They were having psychotic episode and they were attacking everything. And they were picking stones to throw it to the houses. So that means that they were throwing stones into our house and they were breaking this, the windows. They were psychotic events. They were having hack. What we could do was to close our doors because they were attacking us. No one thought about that. Hello, hold on. Can we help these people? That's one thing. Suddenly, people that are being raped in our community don't give them platform to come and talk to us. We don't have comfortable come and talk to us. That to tell them that we are there for you. No matter what happened, we are here for you. We're going to help you and we're going to support you no matter what happens. We don't. Because you know why? When we go through mental health, depression, because it starts with depression. It starts with being closed up. You have nobody to talk to. And you're just in your own world. We cannot follow our Islam principles. Why, must? Why do we pray? 
if we're not helping the people who need support, the people that who need chance in life, to just tell them, you know what? It's going to be okay. I'm here for you. It's going to be all right. We don't tell each other that. We don't tell each other that. Why is it our, our young people or older people are suffering and we don't give them a chance to talk, but we go out there and we say, oh, we Muslim, Allah said this. Allah said we have to look after each other. We have to care for each other, but we're not doing none of that. Why are, we, why are we using Islam not helping? Not. Because to me, that's what Islam means to me. And please, please nod your head if you believe me. Because Islam is a caring religion, isn't it? It's all about caring. It's all about helping. It's all about being there for one another. And it's not even just Muslim. It's even non-Muslim. If your brother and sister, human beings who don't need, who, who need help, you help them. We're not doing that. We are not doing that. So what's happening right now, I need to stop talking. But what I'm going to say to you right now is that I've been told I'm a Muslim. I need to be a good girl. Oh. I live in Europe. I go to school every day. I meet for non-Muslim children, my friends. I want to be part of that life, fit into that, that life. So back home, and I say to my mother, listen, with the question, because children, that's what they do, especially children I'm looking at. Because when I look at like Layla, your face. She's school and she comes back and she will tell you what happened at school today. It's our job. It's our job as a Muslim human being. It's our job as professionals to look out for our people. You cannot tell me that I have no voice because I am a woman. That is another thing as well. Muslim women, we have no voice. As a Muslim woman, we were told to cook, clean, stay there, and you have no voice. As a Muslim brother, you were told to be strong and not to show weakness. But you are a human being. You can, and you can go through depression. You can go through where you feel like the world is against you. But guess what? Because you are a man, you are told to be strong you are not strong in your real life where did you go who did you talk to and that of us we don't have anybody in our community especially in an Islam community to give us the platform to be strong to talk about what's bothering us and take it from there. We do not have that support. And I know that no sheikh, and I invite any sheikh who want to challenge me, cannot tell me, hold on, that is not right. Because there is no support. There is no support. And I leave it there. And you can question me more. Sorry, I just got this. Thank you very much for your input, which is very heartfelt, and you experience these things firsthand, and so you already know how um, what is happening on the ground, what is what what the consequences of leads to alone afterwards. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Thank you very much for joining in this. Uh, webinar and I hope that a lot of good will come from it. I hope that people will find help or the friends will reach out to help other people. Someone um, will open up a bit more or will trust other people, try to be non-judgmental, try to create safe spaces, trying to do the
that these issues exist. Um, with that, I say, um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.